Well, welcome to an episode of Science Monkey, the podcast that seeks to, I don't know, uh, I don't know what we're trying to do. Are we monkey trying with to, science? Are we, are we no. educating the public, Graham? Are we educating yes. each other? and entertaining ourselves there at the same is. time. So, um, the You're idea the science, of, and I'm the monkey. You have to get that straight. I want to be monkey as well. <laughs> uh, so, the idea um, behind this show is to talk about some of the, the news items in science and to make it fun and interesting and accessible for the general public. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Graham is an unusually smart guy, despite the fact that he's, uh, he looks like a monkey. And um, so he has the, uh, the attributes of a somewhat uh, subhuman intellect, but he is actually a fairly, uh, fairly robust and intelligent individual and an accomplished scholar in his own right. But he is not a scholar of science. This is correct. And yet I am. And the so, last part. <laughs> and so he's going to be a, of science, but not uh, a, a sounding board for some of these ideas. So um, we're going to start today talking about one of my favorite topics. And that Should is... we tell uh, about who we are? Or does everyone know who we are? Oh, who are we, Graham? Well, I want you to go first. Uh, okay. Well, I'm a... All right. I'm... You introduced me. That's good. So I'll introduce you, right. Raywat Dionandon, who is, among other things, an epidemiologist, but also a published author. And uh, what it's else? Damn good looking. <laughs> damn good looking. <laughs> Luckily, this is a podcast. So our audience <laughs> won't be distracted by your illumination. My elimination? <laughs> I said illumination. Oh, I'm That's sorry. the wrong word. I'm getting uh, sort of needlessly tongue-tied and nervous and distracted. I yeah. think you're distracted by my good looks. Yeah, that's what yeah, it is. That's understandable. Um, I'm trying to say what else you do. You do some consulting for um, in uh, the health field. Sure. So, I'm, you know, yes, I'm an epidemiologist. What does that mean? Mm. I, I encourage the audience to figure that out. Can you check this mole for me? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Ep- Graham? Epidemiology has nothing to do with skin. Mm. The wise man said that once. Yeah, it's the name of my book, which I will attempt to sell on the website. It's, so, it's on Amazon.com, everyone. <laughs> uh, by the way... Oh, also, you can get words well put by Graham Sanders on there. Who, who is this fellow, Graham Sanders? <laughs> I hear he is a, a scholar of, of medieval Chinese and poetry. Six Records of a Life Adrift. That's a great read. Yeah. Okay. I, and and uh, I, I also hear that Mr. Graham Sanders is a professor at the University of Toronto, where we are right now. Mm-hmm. We are recording this episode from his office on the campus of a real university, the University of Toronto. But nothing we say or do um, represents, represents their views, their views or, in any way or agendas in any way, yeah. shape, or form. Um, in fact, they don't even know we're here. We mm-hmm. broke in and we're here illegally That's and right. uh, this has nothing to do with them whatsoever. Um, so one of, one of my favorite topics is what we call pseudoscience. And um, every time I say the word pseudoscience, I'm reminded of... I like uh, to pronounce it pseudoscience. Well, I, you took my joke. You took my joke. <laughs> because I was going to tell the story of my grade 10 uh, computer science professor who was teaching a pseudocode, which is a kind of proto-computer uh, uh, science code. And he called it pseudocode. Uh, because he had never heard the word pseudo pronounced before. Buff leather code. <laughs> Ironically, he, he wore the same Naga yeah. jacket every day of his teaching life. And if he's listening now, I'm sorry <laughs> that I've identified you as such. Um, right. So what is what is pseudoscience in your opinion? Graham? Pseudoscience is um, information that's masquerading as science. So it addresses itself up as science in order to give itself credibility. But it doesn't have any of the underpinnings of actual scientific rigor. That's an interesting definition. And I never thought of the idea of... Uh, of Dressing it up as science, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think right away now that you mention it of uh, a paper that I teach in my class um, on anti climate change. Mm-hmm. So back in the day, the day being sometime in the nineties, there was uh, a you paper were alive, published, eighteen nineties. <laughs> um, uh, there's a paper published that supposedly reanalyzed statistically some climate change data and mm-hmm. showed that in fact the world's climate is not changing, and this was um, published. Um, in what appeared to be a peer-reviewed format, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was actually published in the Wall Street Journal as right. an advertorial. Right. But it had introduction methods, results, conclusions, mm-hmm. and graphs, but it looked like a peer-reviewed science yeah, journal. footnotes and... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so the world's climatologists um, revolted and attempted to, to uh, publish responses in the Wall Street Journal, and the journal refused to accept the responses. Hmm. Right. So uh, for the longest time... What if they time, took out their own ad and well, published it? Well, because scientists are mm-hmm. poor and... And not as 
They didn't want to stoop that low, thinking. man. <laughs> <laughs> have to pay to actually tell the truth. Right. Imagine so anyway, that. so so it's a good point about pseudoscience. You know, um, not just masquerading as science, but donning the vestments mm -hmm. of science. Well, to, to my mind, here's the difference. If I tell you, leaving a cut onion on your counter is going to keep you from getting a cold, that's just information I'm giving you. But if I say, it's been shown that when you put a cut onion on the counter, it absorbs viruses in the air, and, you know, there are 50% fewer colds among people who have that, blah, blah, and, and I go on with right. sort of some sort of mechanism by how it might work, some sort of evidence, then, it realm, then it's in the realm of Me society. Mechanism, really? Yeah. There's usually a mechanism of some sort. It's a bogus mechanism, but they usually hmm. try and explain it somehow. I I've rarely seen the mechanism. I, I, I know what you're saying about... Uh, the, well, the okay, fake. when we look at the... Um, diet cures autism article yeah i haven't read it yet but i'm sure there's something in there that says this is why eating these foods causes autism i see what you mean right? okay it, grand's re uh, referring to an article that i'll post a link to this on our website which is sciencemonkey.ca by the way eek, eek. <laughs> we're in the process of trying to acquire sciencemonkey.com it's owned by somebody in new delhi right now and um i sound like a mouse rather than a monkey i better work on my monkeys well, now. maybe there's a monkey mouse okay uh, a mouse monkey We'll post um, a picture of it. I'm sure there is. So if you want to, if you want to hear or no, read about what we're talking monkey. about, the links will be available at sciencemonkey.ca, and of course, uh, the show is accessible on iTunes as well. Um, so Bra Graham's responding or referring to an article in the New York Post from uh, last year that talked about um, diet being the key to quote unquote curing autism. Mm -hmm. right. So can this be one of our first features? Rigorous or ridiculous? Hey. You want to do it without with us? Or? Well, we could do that. Okay. So um, we're going to have uh, some special segments on this show, recurring segments. One of them is rigorous or ridiculous. ridiculous. And uh, in this segment, uh, well, explain it, Graham. What's the segment all about? Well, you'll come up with some sort of uh, study. And uh, one way we could do it is you could present it to me, and you've already done the the vetting of it so you know whether I it's have? a rigor, rigorous study this is the, the way i'm framing it you're doing all the work so whether it's a rigorously you know uh uh supported study peer-reviewed with all the proper methodology and so forth or whether it looks like one but really it's kind of ridiculous and so and i would be in the stead of the general reading public just taking a cursory glance at it maybe even reading the abstract which is actually more than most people do and trying to figure out whether I think it's rigorous or ridiculous, and then we can discuss whether it is and why. Sure, well, that's that's fantastic. That's right. exactly what I had in mind. Right. Now, the other thing that we've been—it's uh, almost as though we've spoken about it before, <laughs> which we haven't. <laughs> so the other thing that Graham and I have been uh, considering is offering a prize—not a real cash prize, but you know, a, a prize in name alone for an instance of pseudoscience, and we're struggling with what to name this prize. Yeah, particularly egregious pseudoscience. That's right. Yeah, it's going to be like the Darwin Awards. Right? right, and our original thought was to name it after Jenny McCarthy, but we don't think that's kind of fair to pick on one person who obviously has issues in her life that she's dealing with. Right, But um, if you can think of another name for this prize, let us know. Go to sciencemonkey.ca and, and email mm -hmm. us and contact us. Uh, for today, though, I guess we'll kind of call it the Jenny McCarthy Award. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the inaugural <laughs> Jenny McCarthy Award. This a couple of studies that I, that I sent, um, Graham, uh, before I get before, there. Before, can I derail you? That seems please. to be my function on this podcast. Too. Anytime, you, anytime you get going, I derail <laughs> you. We can have a sip of coffee. Uh, I wanted to discuss other things we could do. Uh, one was uh, something sort of like fun science facts that we wanted to call Did You Know? Did You Know? Did You Know? Um, and if people have fun science facts... Uh, they can send in. My daughter recently told me one. Is that a fact? Yes. Is that a fun science fact? No. The, Graham no, has no. a daughter. That's a fun science <laughs> fact. People. My 14-year-old daughter told me that it was a myth that blood is blue until it's oxidized. That is true. It's a myth. And, you know, for 48 years, I've been looking at the veins in my wrist and going, well, blue it hasn't been oxidized. But apparently yeah. that's just a function of looking through the skin and the artery wall mm. and so forth. Little things like Oh, and then I, I always believe that glass was uh, a very dense liquid. So what we've learned today so far is that Graham is <laughs> suffers from some sort of mental condition. I've been that... vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> He's been vaccinated. I think he got double dose. <laughs> okay. So those are good. All right. And another feature <laughs> that we wanted to call BS for bogus science. Bogus science. Yeah. Um, and what else could we do? Oh, and something about um, science in pre-modern times. So... Sort of non-European, non-modern science. Right, because um, 
uh, we both have fascination with the ancient world, and, and Graham is particularly versed in the ancient world of China, mm -hmm. um, something I know very little about, and I think most of the Western world knows very little about, and mm -hmm. I think it would be quite useful for us to learn about that. So much of what we take for granted in Western science, in fact, has its, its origins in the East, and a lot of it um, was first discovered as well in, in native communities all over the world. Mm -hmm. So many times we are rediscovering the obvious. Or there are alternate ways of framing the ways of looking at the world. Framing information. You liberal pansy. <laughs> no, I your mean... inclusivity and your cultural relativism. <laughs> That's right. That's my job. Be culturally relevant. Um, so let's go back to... Uh, rigorous or rigorous ridiculous. Rigorous or ridiculous. And you were referring to the autism article, I think. Uh, was it? Well, the autism, uh, let's go back to the autism article afterwards, mm -hmm. okay. if we can, right? I want to I talk about these two papers that I sent you. Oh, right, right. Um, so one of them is called... Uh, an association between breastfeeding mm -hmm. and intelligence, educational attainment, and income at 30 years of age, a prospective birth cohort study from Brazil. Right. And that is uh, published in The Lancet. And the other one is called... Uh, I load up, uh, oh, the homeopathy here. one? Yes, right. Okay. An OPO label pilot study of homeopathic treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children and youth. Mm -hmm. And again, you can uh, access these papers on the website sciencemonkey.ca mm -hmm. if you want to read along. Because um, Graham hasn't read these yet, uh, what about I summarize them a bit for him? Sure. So the open label pilot study of homeopathic treatment actually was produced by this university, by the University of Toronto. Okay. And uh, essentially, it looks at whether or not certain homeopathic, quote-unquote, remedies were mm -hmm. useful in treating hyperactivity disorder amongst children. And so they took some kids, they measured their hyperactivity level, they gave them the drug, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, drug, and then they showed that, in fact, the kids became less hyperactive after mm -hmm. taking the drug. That's the essence of that one. The other one... Um, the breastfeeding paper, which was quite controversial, by the way, around mm -hmm. the world, showed that um, uh, the women who breastfeed their children 30 years later had children of higher IQ than those who were not breastfed. Mm -hmm. And it's a landmark study because for the first time ever, they had an enormous sample size. They had a prospective, meaning they followed it through time, mm -hmm. um, study of over 30 years. Longitudinal? Longitudinal, exactly. And, um, and, it, and it runs contrary to other studies that have shown, in fact, there is no association between intelligence and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So, uh, your first reactions, Dr. Sanders. My first reactions Sanders. to both these articles. I'm just staring at them right sure. now. As a non-specialist. Well, let me take the breastfeeding one first. What was, yeah, let's always take the breastfeeding <laughs> one first. Put my breast foot forward. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> anyway. No, but, you know, it makes you think about my scientists. What? Who said that? <laughs> That's not appropriate for a family-friendly And this podcast. is why this podcast is worth what you're paying for it. Okay. <laughs> so, a couple of things. Well, first of all, it's in The Lancet. The which breastfeeding one. initially would have made me think, oh, that's wonderful. But The Lancet's been known to publish. Didn't The Lancet publish the Wakefield? It did. Stuff? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Graham is referring to the, again, landmark study that supposedly showed a connection between uh, vaccination and autism, which has since been debunked many times and withdrawn by the Lancet. Which did immeasurable damage, I think. Um, and so that's on the Lancet for doing something like that. So um, already I'm a little bit wary, not because it's in the Lancet, but I'm not taking the Lancet as necessarily proof of its rigor. Um, then if I look at the title, Association Between Breastfeeding and Intelligence, Educational Attainment and Income at 30 Years of Age, a Prospective Birth Cohort Study from Brazil, there are so many variables lumped into there between breastfeeding, intelligence, educational attainment, income at 30 years of age, and it being in Brazil, and then it's all tied together with the very loose word association. So at the outset, I'm not sure that this study is going to be able to show anything of merit. That's, ver that's very uh, perceptive of you. And um, uh, the word association is the appropriate word to use. They're not saying causality. They're mm -hmm. saying they're associated. And they're not saying correlation either. Is there a difference? Uh, yes, there is sort of correlation. Technically means a relationship between two continuous variables. Mm -hmm. Association doesn't have to be continuous. So And it could be a cluster of variables. Right. So whether or not they breastfed is a dichotomous variable, and mm -hmm. so that's not continuous. And whether or not they have high IQ is also dichotomous. Mm -hmm. So the relationship there would be an association, not a correlation. <laughs> I'm, you know, you're... It's, it's a linguistic issue at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So um, let me tell you more about that study and see if you can pick up on what the fatal flaw actually okay. is. So what they did was they looked at um, 
um, the baseline characteristics of the mothers mm -hmm. and their uh, and their situation, and they try to control for that. Right. So, can I ask a question? Yes. Mothers that are more likely to breastfeed are yeah. they already even more educated, or more good. affluent? Very good. You're getting at the heart of the matter. Yeah. That is absolutely true. So, um, the biggest confounding element in this is the mother's characteristics. Mm -hmm. And we think about characteristics, there's a couple of ways to think about it. There is, as you mentioned, her socioeconomic status, her personal um, health, mm -hmm. right, her family situation. The biggest predictor of a child's IQ is what? Do you know? How much they were spoken to and whether those were positive words when they were young. Those are important predictor mm -hmm. factors. It's not the biggest predictor. Mm -hmm. um, oh, educational uh, level of the parents? Very close. Okay. Very close. In fact, that is in fact what they controlled for right. in in this study. Mm -hmm. They didn't control for the thing that really is the biggest predictor. The, how much money the family has? Very no. close as well. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I give up. The, the intelligence of the mother. Intelligence of the smarter mother. Smarter mothers oh. have smarter kids. Okay. Right? And in this case, we're measuring intelligence as IQ. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't have that baseline information from many of the mothers, mm -hmm. and so they had a proxy arm-waving argument that high education was the same as high wow. intelligence. And There's as so we many, know, that's yeah, not true. So many caveats that I don't understand why the study is published, actually. Well, it's published because um, it's actually a good study aside from that. You know, um, it's a lot of asides. <laughs> well... <laughs> I mean, there are other things you can think of, too. Sort of um, uh, breastfeeding mothers would spend more time with their kids, sure. perhaps, than uh, mothers who sure. might well, can't spend more time because they have to go out and work or something. That, that's Maybe true. Maybe the amount of time the mother's spending has something to do with That's absolutely it, true. M mind you, the intervention here would be breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So that incorporates all these things like time and intimacy and oxytocin, etc. They're oh. not saying so they're, it they're is the, the milk itself. Stuff. It's the entire event of right. breastfeeding. So I'm forgiving for them for those mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. It's just that one flaw they couldn't control for right. puts everything else at risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't think that's bad science. It's just not great it's science. not great science. Yeah. And so the, um, the way the media picked up on it was the big problem in that one. Mm -hmm. Now, the other study... Like so had, the media just uncritically said... There's this correlation between that's right. breastfeeding and that's right. And of course, all the breastfeeding advocates picked right. up on it too and went crazy. And then everyone who couldn't breastfeed felt awful about themselves. Or, yeah, or I, I can't breastfeed anymore, and I feel awful about it. You know? God knows I've tried. <laughs> not as awful as I do. <laughs> well, you're not doing your part. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> so, moving on to the next study, if you can. Mm -hmm. um, that one is the. So we've demonstrated that this is. Not ridiculous, it's not but ridiculous. not entirely rigorous. That's right, okay. in my opinion. And it would make it more rigorous if they could have controlled or accurately measured intelligence of the mother. That's right. Okay. Uh, there's probably other, other factors there too, but that's the one that really jumped out at me and, and to other commentators. Mm -hmm. So the next paper is the homeopathy one. And mm -hmm. this one, they call it a pilot study, which is its saving grace. Right. Because we expect less rigor from pilot studies. Mm -hmm. What does the open label mean? Um, it means, I, I don't know the exact definition. <laughs> gotcha. I would think as a lay reader, it meant they, everyone knew whether they were giving them the placebo I, or the homeopathic quote unquote drug. I suppose it's a possibility. I think it's a pharm pharmaceutical term that, that, oh, you know, what the, um, manufacturer was or something. I don't know. Okay. Right. In we my experience with clinical out. trials, I, I never heard the term open label referred to as a non-concealed. Right. right? Non-blind or. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, right. And they don't define what open label means. In it's it's a known term. I just haven't, okay. don't know what it means today because apparently I'm it's not a known term. But... Well, obviously, I'm showing the flaws of my education right now. So um, the important part of this study, though, is the core methodology. There is mm -hmm. an important aspect that is profoundly troubling. Okay, well, let me look at it briefly. Sure. While there... you're while you're doing that, I'll, I'll explain again yeah, to okay. to the reader what's going on here. So maybe again, you say a bit about homeopathy too. I guess I think people. Can do their own All right. Relying on me to be problematic in my commentary. Um, the study again looks at children who are hyperactive, and it gives them these homeopathic remedies and sees whether or not they became less hyperactive. And in fact, they did. That is, in essence, what the study did. It took a group of hyperactive kids, gave them an intervention, and the kids got better. That's all you need to know, mm -hmm. and you can probably see what the problem is just in that description. Um, sorry, I was reading. I was trying to figure out how many kids no were actually involved in this. Um, that would study. be an important consideration. So, they, did they control for anything exactly. else? Exactly. 
No. So, so the very fact that they're in a study, that people are paying attention to them, that they know they're supposed to be performing a task, exactly right. could already focus their attention. Right? E- exactly right. And now You could um, just give them water. So here's the thing, is everyone gets better by themselves anyway, mm-hmm. for all, from almost any ailment. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's some ailments you don't get better from. Mm-hmm. This is why we need control groups. Because mm-hmm. the question isn't, are you going to improve from baseline? The question is, are you going to improve from baseline more so than no intervention? Right. Right? It's mm-hmm. kind of like, I can cure your common cold in two weeks mm-hmm. if I slap you in the forehead every yeah. day. Right? right? You're going to get cured anyway in two mm-hmm. weeks. So this lack of a control group is deeply troubling. Now, um, a lot of us do publish uncontrolled trials right. uh, because we're out of money or that, you know, whatever case may be. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just publish things as quickly as we can. Uh, so wait, they didn't, everyone received the treatment? That's right. That, how does that even get published? Then? It's a pilot study. That's how they get around it. But, and who is this portion de complement and blah, 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 this German... I, I don't know. We don't even know who this is, right? I so. don't know. I, I tend not to judge the journal too much. Okay. Um, they publish what they publish. I think, you know, they get away with it by calling a pilot study. Right. Um, so pilot studies typically are done to collect baseline data that is used for further calculations mm-hmm. to design a better study. So I'm forgiving of them to that extent. However, I do wonder whether the original intent was actually a pilot study mm-hmm. or whether it was Just to, to manufacture it. significance of a homeopathic Yeah, case. so that they can then cite it and say that's a good study, and then maybe they'll just call it a study that they cite it rather than calling it a pilot study. That's exactly right. Um, wow, that's really disappointing. <laughs> so, did you, how did you pick these two? They're in the, uh, in the media. They're in the media. So, okay. I pick newsworthy ones. I think so, I may have talked about them in other podcasts as well. I don't remember. So, this one is patently ridiculous, I would think. Ridiculous um, is a strong word. It is ridiculous. Yeah. For the purposes of our podcast, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, because how can you measure the significance of something unless you have a control? That's exactly right. Um, now, the fact that they call it a pilot study mm-hmm. is what saves them. But you keep on saying able. that, but what kind of baseline does it give you if you're not measuring it against a control group? You can determine something around sample size, right? For It gives you some information of effect size so that you mm-hmm. can then plug it into your sample size formula mm-hmm. um, for designing the next study. That's usually what we use pilot studies for. And how hard it would, it, would it be to get another 20 kids and give them water? And You're absolutely them? right. You're absolutely right. So there's a reason they didn't do that. Uh, I believe so. I'm not going to say outright because I don't want to get sued. Right. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, actually, as when I'm thinking about this, um, it occurred to me that I often thought of these studies as just being poorly designed through neglect or ignorance. That's but right. they might be poorly designed on purpose for... Absolutely, could be. Now, that, particular, some sort of that particular paper, I believe, um, because it was produced by University of Toronto Scholars, I believe that this university's Nobel Prize winners got together and complained about it. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe they sent a letter complaining about the fact that it was, in fact, an uncontrolled trial, and that should not right. be allowed to be... In, in to be Is it a problem that one of the participants or one of the named authors in the study is a homeopathic, homeopathic practitioner? No, because um, I mean, let's say that. you were uh, testing the efficacy of uh, a surgical implant for your knee. Mm-hmm. We'd expect the author to be a surgeon, right. a knee surgeon. So that's not the problem. Okay. The problem, of course, homeopathy is a fake science. Right. <laughs> but I'm forgiving of that uh, so long as the science is good mm-hmm. and it's not here. I was When I was reading this, I recalled an article I read recently, I think it was in the New York Times Magazine, about this... Um, guy who was on Fox News all the time that presented himself as a uh, CIA, former CIA, um, former CIA operative. And he was always giving his feedback on uh, America's role in the world in terms of uh, espionage and so forth. And all these other actual CIA operatives started to realize no one knows who this guy is and he's talking <laughs> bullshit. Right. And so they finally called him out. And the, the, the guy who did the most work to prove that he was fake, his um, what's it, method is uh, not to assume that um, someone is telling is lying and you're trying to pick holes in their argument, but he flips it around and says, I'm going to try and prove that they are what they say they are. Hmm. If he is actually, say, an operative, what would he be saying? Like, what would I need? And then he goes to try to find that. So rather than trying to look at what's presented to him and then pick the pick the parts, the the holes in the, in the argument. So in in a way, if I look at the homeopathy thing, rather than sort of just saying, oh, there's there's this wrong and this wrong and this wrong, 
maybe ways and how would we design a study that would prove that's interesting that's a good uh, scholastic and once we've uh, done activity. that then you can sort of measure other studies there's an activity we undertake in in scientific rigor we call it critical appraisal mm -hmm. so you look at a study and there's a series of steps we undertake to determine critically if the study is good or not and they include things like is a sample size sufficient mm -hmm. is the design appropriate for the question mm -hmm. being asked is the question actually well phrased mm -hmm. is uh, our conclusions drawn rational given the results given, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, I wanted to bring up uh, one topic while we have some time left here around why are people drawn to pseudoscience? Right. Yeah. You know, what do you think? Like, um, There's so much evidence, for example, that homeopathy does not work, mm -hmm. and yet millions of people adhere to it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, educated, well-resourced people who you know are Facebook friends of ours, <laughs> who see all the crap we post right. about how bad it is, yeah. will still use homeopathy. Why? Why um, do you do it, Graham? Because yeah. you're the layperson in this conversation. <laughs> Excuse me while well, I have my homeopathic coffee. <laughs> is it diluted with water? It is water, yes. <laughs> well, actually, I looked into homeopathy when I realized that the levels of dilution are so great that there's actually wouldn't be a molecule of the That's substance right. left. Thus, they argue in. that there doesn't have to be a molecule in there because the water molecules will take on the characteristics of what they've the, been adjacent This to. is the example of when I talk about a mechanism. There's always some sort of mechanism right. that's, that's cited. Right. Um, so why would someone believe that? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, that's... There are a number of reasons. One would, it's, if you want to, I don't think it's, I think it's too strong to call it a conspiracy, but the same sort of mindset is attracted to conspiracy sometimes, I think, in that it's a way of seeing outside the mainstream so that you feel like you have more control over things, right? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And in fact, I'm, I'm forgiving towards people who believe in pseudoscience. I'll tell you why. I think there's an evolutionary advantage to it. Mm -hmm. People who believe in pseudoscience, as wrong as they are, are seeing patterns. They're mm -hmm. seeing correlations mm -hmm. and assuming causation, which we know is incorrect. However, there's an evolutionary reason for this. If you consider um, our forebears half a million years ago prancing about the savannah, and um, let's say at the middle of the night they're asleep and the fire has gone out, mm -hmm. and they think they see a couple of eyes staring at them in the darkness. Um, it could be a couple of eyes, or it could be a couple of leaves mm -hmm. that are reflecting But it's safer to them. assume it's a, couple, it's a predator. Exactly. <laughs> But given patterns which are have proof and have evidence and which have a history behind them and so forth versus these patterns that just come out of nowhere, why would you choose the patterns that have no basis? Because um, I think the, 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 the penalty for, for choosing wrongly, the penalty for taking homeopathic drugs is just you get a little poorer. Mm -hmm. You can't hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you, you may actually cure yourself if on the off chance that you're right. Or just, you just get better naturally. Exactly. Right. Whereas the penalty for assuming, oh, it's probably just leaves that I'm seeing here, mm -hmm. is pretty is pretty high if you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're eaten by the beast. But the penalty for taking something homeopathic instead of That's something true. actually effective is that pretty is true. high. That's true. It's not a perfect yeah. reasoning I'm giving here. I'm just saying, I believe, though, there is something in our genes that compels us to see relationships that don't right. exist. Right, but... There's something at play here which means that you have to reject a pattern which has more basis to it yeah, that's true. for a pattern that has less basis to that's it. That's true. Um, and I think there's also so, a tendency for us to, to want magical thinking. I think it's a suspicion of authority, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then you replace it with a new authority. Yeah. Like, I won't believe my doctor with his you know, 12 years of training. I will believe this fellow who got his internet degree when mm -hmm. he speaks a, a good game. Right. I mean, also, there are probably there are people may have had adverse experiences in the past with, if you want to call it mainstream medicine, versus these alternative medicines. And so that's true. Also, who are you more likely to be gravitate towards? Someone who says, "Well, this treatment is going to give you a lot of pain," and mm -hmm. the clinical trial suggests you have eighty five percent chance. Yeah, of, you know, yeah. Or a person, I can cure you. Just like take right. this dog feces and mm -hmm. rub it under your crotch, mm -hmm. and then bark at the moon for a while. That's not effective. Well, um, not the twice that I tried it. Yeah. Maybe it's the wrong breed of dog. You'll try anything twice. Because <laughs> the first time, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> well, you're a scientist. <laughs> I heard someone say that the last words to be spoken by anybody in human civilization mm -hmm. will be, hmm, let's try it this way. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> what, what if we change the polarity? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's a good place to end. It is. That's just yeah. exactly uh, almost 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, once again, uh, noble, loyal listener, 
please go to sciencemonkey.ca. I like you, how you use the singular there. <laughs> if uh, if you have any suggestions for us of what to cover in a future episode, uh, please uh, either write to us. Names for our segments. A comment and names for our segments. And uh, things that I can make Graham do during these podcasts. I maybe jump up and down and scream like bald eagle. If you buy me coffee. Okay. All right. So until next time, oop, 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 oop. oop. Bye.